All right, here is a story about, I'm not sure what it is, Bigfoot, maybe a dog man, but it's real interesting. The gentleman is from Minnesota, and here's what he writes. Back when my wife and I were still dating in 2017, we decided to head down to Pickerel Lake in Lilydale, Minnesota. We liked to go down and sit at the boat ramp back then and have some alone time together. On one of those evenings, we were sitting there, holding hands and enjoying each other's company in the quiet serenity of the night, when my girlfriend happened to glance over my shoulder and went ghost white pale. I couldn't understand what was wrong with her. The look on her face made me think that she didn't understand it either. What's wrong? I asked, thinking maybe she might be having a heart attack or something. She pulled her hand away from mine and began shushing me and trying to get me to stop talking. Well, I didn't know what to think, but since she kept staring in that direction, I finally turned around and I looked too. She was staring at a bunch of prairie grass that was eight feet high. Prairie weeds grow all along the lake there and they can get pretty tall. I couldn't see anything that might have frightened my girlfriend, so I stood up on two big boulders that were just off the shore by the boat launch to get a better look. It was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. I stared at it for a minute, trying to make my mind accept what I was looking at, before turning back around to my girlfriend. She was already heading for the truck, and I looked at what I thought was an old gentleman standing in the grass holding on to it and sort of weaving back and forth. About that time, I heard the truck door slam and the locks engage, and my mind caught up with me. Goosebumps ran up my arms and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and that sudden realization that this was real swept over me like nothing I'd ever felt before or could ever imagine. This wasn't some old man. This was an eight-foot-tall being covered in red-brown hair. The truck was 50 feet behind me, and I'm pretty sure I broke the land speed record trying to get to it. The doors were still locked, and because we were parked so close, I hadn't bothered to take the key out of my ignition. I knocked on the window, but my girl was sitting there, still white as a ghost and shaking uncontrollably. Well, I knocked again, but she wouldn't look at me. It was as if she'd gone into some kind of shock. She kept rocking and shaking and staring straight ahead. I stood there, pounding on the window, pretty much begging to be let in, and I glanced over, and that big hairy thing was coming right at us. Well, my heart stopped for just an instant, my breath froze in my chest. I was about to accept my fate when, click, I heard the doors unlock. My girlfriend had come out of her stupor long enough to let me in. She was already locking the doors again and was sliding into my seat. That thing blew past my window with unbelievable speed and rounded my truck and crossed in front of us. And then it went down the hill alongside the lake. What's taking you so long? I heard my girlfriend shouting. Why aren't we leaving? She didn't want that thing coming back and running past her window. Well, I started the truck and I put it in gear and we rolled around the boat launch down toward the main road. If you turn right down that road, she said as we approached, I'll never speak to you again. That thing had gone to the right, and she was afraid it would pop back out of the woods, I guess. I turned left toward Mendota, and our place in St. Paul wasn't that far either way. She didn't speak about it again until the next morning when she asked me why I took so long getting into the truck. Well, it was a while before we went back to Lilydale, and when we finally did, it was a beautiful spring day. I talked her into taking a walk down where the boat ramp goes into the Mississippi. We were heading down the path when my girlfriend suddenly turned to me and said, I want to go back to the truck right now. My first thought was, not again. It couldn't be, right? Well, it actually wasn't, but it was close enough. Along the path ahead were four or five trees that had been snapped off right at eight feet above the ground. They were snap like twigs, each one facing the same direction toward Mendota. She grabbed my hand and marched me back along the trail as fast as we could. She wasn't about to let me stand there and wait for something to pop out of the woods. It's been a few years now since we've been down to Lilydale by the Mississippi River. 
and I wish I had thought to get a picture of those trees with my phone. We've told a few people our story, but they think we're all crazy, so now I'm telling you. <laughs> what makes you think I don't think you're crazy, brother? Uh, I think the man's name is Robert. Uh, it, uh, this was a really good story. This is several, uh, this is one long kind of drawn out event when he's kind of hanging out with his wife at night on a lake. He actually sees, he has a visual, he sees these, this thing. And then at a later date, they see evidence of Bigfoot activity. Uh, could be dog man, probably Bigfoot activity. Anyway, I thought it was awesome. Great story. Thank you for sending it. All right, all right. Welcome to the Dixie Cryptid What If It's True podcast. So glad you clicked on the video. Hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, a couple of things before we did go to the rest of this podcast. You know, I'm doing these shorts. They're little 60 second things and I'm getting some comments from people who think I'm just switching to only shorts. Why, why do you think that? So the shorts are added to the channel. They're just easy to do. They take five or 10 minutes to do and I throw them up on the internet and then I go back to work. So that's all they are. They're just little bits and pieces, uh, little short 60 second short stories and I love doing them. Hey, by the way, if you can write a short story in 150 words or less, 150 words is just about one minute, puts me right under one minute, send it to me. And in the subject line, write short, S-H-O-R-T. Everybody that has sent one so far has had their short read. I think I've got 15 or 20 of them up. So uh, anyway, that's the story on the shorts. Plus, there's a brand new episode of Steve Lilly. It's Steve Lilly number three on the Steve Lilly Journals channel. There will be an end screen for the Steve Lilly Journal entry number three. It's a brand new story. It's not a not a rewrite. It's not. It's just brand new, and uh, that's kind of the way I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna. Till I get the other ten that are uh, that had uh, been originally released fixed up. I'm going to sprinkle new ones in there and kind of rearrange the order of all these. And so go to the Steve Lilly channel. All right, enough talking. Let's get back into this podcast. Hope you guys enjoy it. All right, here we go. All right, this person definitely wants to be anonymous and the story's about Bigfoot. And here's what he has to write. In July of 2015, my son was on a seven-day, 50-mile backpacking trip with his Boy Scout troop between Yosemite National Park and Mammoth Lakes, California. He has since achieved Eagle Scout and graduated high school. He was honor roll and first lieutenant in ROTC. Sorry I had to brag. I'm a real proud dad. Well, you should be proud. That's Those are great achievements. Eagle Scout is, uh, is a phenomenal achievement. I have a good friend of mine that was an Eagle Scout, and he went on to be a doctor. And he was, and I, he lives in Nashville, and I went and visited him about two months ago and stayed the night there. And he's a single guy, and uh, he's got this huge house. He's 59, 59 or 60 years old, and he's already retired. He's done really well. So Eagle Scouts uh, tend to be achievers. Okay, let's get moving here. His scout troop completed the 50-miler every year. In 2015, eight boys and two adult leaders started the trip. I was no longer able to go along because of issues with my knees. They quickly realized that one of the boys wasn't quite prepared for the journey, so they decided to alter the route to go through easier terrain. Their first day out, they ran into a group of free-range goats and cattle. My son said that other livestock had bells around their necks and it was annoying as hell listening to them bang and clank around. They decided to make camp under some small trees there. No open fires were allowed in California outside of designated campgrounds, so they went to bed shortly after dark, which would have been around 9 p.m. They hung their packs in the trees to keep the wildlife out, and my son settled into his one-man coffin tent. At 2.30 a.m., he woke to the sounds of cowbells clanging and the livestock mewing and bleeding as they were upset and moving quickly away from wherever they were. The sound was interrupted by what my son described as the strangest cry or scream he had ever heard. 
Even more disturbing, it was answered back by another strange howl from the opposite direction. He was now fully awake and sitting up in his tiny tent with only a four-inch survival knife, and he listened to the yells, or perhaps communications, and they got closer and grew louder. Then there was a terrified bawl from a cow, along with a loud clanging of its bell, as if it were running away from a predator. Then it cut off, suddenly, like someone had turned off a switch. Well, that was followed by complete silence. My son spent the rest of the night holding that small knife and jumping at every sound. The next morning, he asked his friend if he had heard anything, but he hadn't. We've listened to Sasquatch cries and sounds on the web, and he says some are similar, but not exactly what he heard. I know we live in California, the land of fruits and nuts, but we have spent a lot of time outdoors backpacking and camping. We know what most of the wildlife in the southwestern deserts and Sierras sound like. My son won't come right out and say that it was Bigfoot, but he will say that it sounded like nothing he had ever heard before or since. I just thank God that he still loves the outdoors and refuses to get spooked by this experience. He has the right attitude. He believes these creatures do exist. And if they do, they have been out there for a long time and probably don't want anything more to do with us than we do with them. And I agree with that. And I'm glad he didn't stop going in the woods. You know, a lot of people do. They have these experiences. They hear noises or, you know, everything short of a visual encounter. And they just quit going in the woods. Or at least that's what they say in these emails to me. So I wouldn't do that. I'd keep going. I mean, it's just too much fun to be outside and I don't know. So I, I just wouldn't. Don't don't let that scare you out of the woods. You know, we never get stories of Bigfoot hurting people ever. All these stories I've ever done, Bigfoot's never hurt anybody. So a uh, very cool email and congratulations to your son. I think I got this a couple of years ago and I'm sure he's doing really well now, but uh, appreciate the email. Thank you. This story is in the category of the paranormal. I'm not sure how you'd classify it. The writer's name is Dusty Miller, and he claims the story is true. And I know Dusty. Dusty doesn't lie. He's a good friend. I love him. And here's his story. Back in 1975, while we were in law school, a friend of mine and I were fishing in Lake Chapaca on the Canadian-Washington border. At that time, the road to the lake was long, dirt, rough, and a rocky drive. They may have paved it since then, I really don't know. We were poor students who didn't have trucks or four-wheel drives and the like, but instead we had my family's old Volvo. Volvos and rocky roads don't mix well, but soon he'd lost his steering or transmission or some damn thing, and I crawled under the car to take a look. When he fired it up, a stream of fluid came shooting out of a metal tube. Apparently, a rock had punctured the line. We had no choice but to try to make it back to civilization, and we got to the main highway before we could go no further. As we sat there, a huge yellow 1960 Pontiac convertible pulled up. A six-foot-five-inch tall man got out and asked if he could help. The man looked rather strange. He was very pale and long, bleached blonde hair that was combed straight back. He was slender built and had bird-like features. But hell, he wanted to help, and we needed to get to the nearest town. We explained our circumstances, and he said, No problem, I can help. He walked back and opened his massive trunk, and inside we could see his entire life. Clothing was neatly folded in the cardboard box, and toiletries were organized in another. We saw framed photographs, food, water, and tools, and you name it, he had it. He proceeded to pull a long four-inch nylon strap out of a box and affix it to the front of the Volvo, and then towed us into town, which boasted a gas station and very little else. The attendant put the car on the hoist and proclaimed that we were screwed. He had nothing to replace a tube on the Volvo, and before we had time to digest this fact, our newly acquired friend, who had been standing patiently and knowingly nearby, 
again proclaimed, I can help. He then walked back to the cavernous truck and pulled out a small rubber hose and two small hose clamps and followed by a hacksaw. The hose was soon replaced, but the gas station didn't have the fluid we needed, and it should have come as no surprise when our blonde friend dove back into his trunk and produced the proper fluid. Our bemusement had now progressed to full-on amazement. We offered to pay him, but he refused any form of compensation except for the fluid. He then offered to follow us out of town to make sure everything worked okay. About five miles out, the road straightened and went uphill. We heard the roar of his huge engine as he passed us at a high rate of speed, smiling and waving with his blonde hair flying in the wind. It's a sight I will never forget. And then, as he screamed up the hill in front of us, he and his convertible vanished. They faded away. There were no side roads, no turnoffs, no brake lights, nothing. The dude was just gone. My friend and I looked at each other. Our eyes were wide. Where the hell did he go? I asked. We slowed and looked along the roadway, but neither of us could find a place where he could have pulled off the road. He simply disappeared into thin air. My companion has since passed away, and I'm pushing it, but I will not be surprised at all if, upon crossing over, that blind guy will be there to guide me along. This is a true story. Dusty, I love you, man. You, do, <laughs> I can't really go deep into how I know Dusty, but he's, and he and I have never seen each other. We live in totally... We live completely across the country from each other, but we've had correspondence and we've talked on the phone and I just love this man. He's just a smart man. And we have, I think probably similar personality traits. And if we had been closer in the same age, which we're not too far apart, I think he and I would have been really good friends, uh, had we grown up in the same town or met each other in school or whatever. So Dusty, thanks for the story. Here is an email from Pennsylvania. I thought this was really, really cool. The woman writes, On a cold winter night in 1973, my friends and I gathered our ice skates and headed for the pond. It had recently frozen and we wanted to be the first to skate it. With our thermoses full of hot chocolate and our snacks, we walked the railroad track that would take us to the pond. It was a little over a mile away. The railroad was a line that ran back and forth to the coal mines. They delivered coal to the Pittsburgh steel mills. The tracks were surrounded by forests, and after dark it was a bit creepy. But even so, we enjoyed the walk. When we arrived at the pond, our group was excited to be the first to arrive. Others would arrive later, but for now, we had the whole pond to ourselves. My friend Larry carried an old tire with us, and he used that to start a fire, adding wood to it after it was burning. We were having a wonderful time, and then my friend Joyce yelled that something was wrong. She had seen a yellow light glowing under the ice where she skated. Everyone stopped to hear better. We looked like mannequins frozen on the ice for a minute. I skated toward the fire. I had an uneasy feeling about this. I could see the light getting brighter until half of the pond turned from blue and white to a glowing orange. It wasn't long until everyone was near me by the fire, and we watched as the disc that I would estimate to be 20 feet around and a few feet thick broke upward through the ice and hovered for a few seconds. The ice and water blew all over us. Thank goodness everyone had gotten off the ice or someone could have been drowned. The disc hovered above the ice for a minute and then accelerated up into the sky until we couldn't see it. Well, after that, we talked about it every day on the bus going to school for a long time. And then the subject grew distant until we stopped talking about it. There is no way to know what we observed. Who would ever be able to explain it? But I remember it well. It feels fresh in my memory. And I'm glad no one was hurt. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, it's like from a movie. It's like a whole spaceship emerges out from under a frozen pond right there while everybody's watching. 
You know what? I hope this is true because wouldn't that be cool? Glad nobody got hurt too, but wouldn't that be cool if that was true? All right. Thank you. Teresa is the writer for sending the email. It was really good. This is an email I got in 2019 and I'm remarkably just getting to it. This event occurred in July of 2018. Here's what the man writes. Last July 2018, I was staying in an isolated region, which had limited access behind three locked gates, 20 miles south of Whitehorn, California, in a primitive 4x4 road. This place is at the end of the road. It's a lost world of primeval forest on a northern border of vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove onto the coast and east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg as can be seen on Google Earth. At 3 a.m., I was awake. It was hot, it was dark, and completely silent in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to 300 meters, began knocking on wood. It was best described as loud wax on a tree trunk by a big club or branch. It started with one knock, which got my attention with a brief hesitation and then several more knocks, but randomly timed, some in succession and others after hesitation. The knocking was loud, and it was so loud it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted a minute or two, and my first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protected area, These knocks were from something large, and no North American animal could have made them. Listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made, I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Percy and North to Willow Creek. Just two weeks ago, When waiting at the first lock gate to this same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which I cannot explain. As I waited in the dusk for 45 minutes waiting to meet a party at the gate who were running late, I heard a loud wail scream call that I've never heard before in nature. The call of this thing I located at my 2 o'clock facing east up a heavily wooded area above me two to three hundred meters once again. I instantly knew where I had heard this familiar call. About three years ago when watching a Bigfoot reality show where the Squatch Hunters were making this strange, unique call. At that time, I remember thinking how ridiculous it seemed for people to be on television, trekking at night, making strange calls in the woods. There was a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, and then silence for a minute, leaving me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal. Pondering what I know about the wilderness, either that was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud, and it echoed down the mountain as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster waiting in silence for me for 45 minutes in that remote location just to hang out in these impenetrable woods and prank me was highly unlikely. Having only a moment to ponder this oddity, there began another call, three to four hundred meters to the north of the first, approximately at my eight o'clock. It was also just as loud but only three calls in succession with a distinct higher pitch on the end. Well, this blew my mind, because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids, but the response from what was clearly not an owl brought chills down my spine. I quickly moved closer to my vehicle and listened for another 30 minutes in the darkness, and I'll never forget this second vocalization, as it was so unique, and this was obviously communication between two individuals, I had a fourth experience, which I must mention here in context, but it happened just the night before the dual vocalizations. It was on Friday night, November 1, 2019, and I had just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented, located along an extremely rugged canyon area at the Matoli River. It was dusk, and it was quite dark already in the forest. 
I was outside looking at the stars, taking in the newness of these rugged mountains. Up above, again, 300 meters up into the east of the river, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest scream I've ever heard. So loud, I thought it was produced by some kind of banshee from a horror movie. The screaming continued full throttle for five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but they can't scream like this. It sounded much louder and guttural, literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could produce. At that time, the night after Halloween, I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer to the neighborhood. I listened for a bit and then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot never entered my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I witnessed these two calls waiting at the gate. I have since been over and over in my mind why I have been so lucky to hear or experience this mystery, much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. All this in a 24-hour period? I began poring over the USGS maps and satellite images to ascertain what the link may be. Were there any people or neighbors or access for individuals in the areas I experienced which may explain this? I have since hiked all of these areas searching for any activity but found only empty dense woods. Could one creature in such obvious stress on one night have triggered the coincidental travel of at least two more unknown creatures the very next night? I've talked to many locals about hearing strange noises, but no one claims anything, or they don't want to be ridiculed. I'd like to know if there have been recent experiences by others in my area. I'm a 60-year-old man with a high degree of credibility, extensive wilderness experience in forests and jungles, and I've tracked and lived in remote areas in Africa, Australia, Central and South America, many places of potential danger and never had an inkling of fear. I was born and raised near Yellowstone Park and never had bad experiences with grizzlies, mountain lions, or wolves. And traveling all these years with a firm understanding of the ecosystems, I never could have believed in such mysteries that anything new would ever be discovered. What has happened to me recently has completely changed me on many levels. There's a mystery in these woods, and I have a few ideas how to find the answer to it. Please feel free to contact me if you'd like to access these remote locations. Nope, I'm not going in those remote locations. I'm going to stay right here in Mississippi, where there, well, at least where I live, there aren't any Bigfoot. I like it that way. Thank you for the story. All right, here's a story from Hank. Uh, it's an email from Hank, and here's what he writes. Before I begin, you once told a story about a Bigfoot on Clayton Highway. My sister, my mother-in-law, and my four sons all saw Bigfoot on that road. I don't remember that story. Maybe uh, Clayton Highway. I don't even know what state that's in. As for me, I saw a lot of strange things while I was in the Navy and while I was growing up in Seal, Alabama. Okay, maybe this is in Alabama. In 1982, I got a late start heading out from Cecil Field, Florida. I was driving my new 1981 Ford truck to Fort Benning, Georgia. The leaves were gone from the trees, so I know it was winter time. The moon was out, and it was a clear night. Fifteen miles before I had to turn to drive into Fort Benning, I looked into a valley that I was passing by and saw an object. It was some kind of gray metal with no paint. I had to pull over so I could get a better view. It was shooting beams of light in different directions as it moved away from me. I haven't got time for this tonight, I told myself, and I drove on south for another hundred yards. And then I got my head on straight. I knew I was almost out of gas and the next gas station was too far away in that direction. I was going to have to turn around anyway, so I managed a U-turn and drove slowly past that spot again but what I saw wasn't there. I saw a flash out of the corner of my eye, and then the next thing I knew, I was sitting at a gas station in Columbus, Georgia. I have no idea how I got there. I looked at my watch. If it was correct, there was no way I could have driven that far in that amount of time. 
and even if I could have, the last thing I knew, I was almost out of gas. I don't want to know what did or didn't happen to me between the valley and the gas station in Columbus. I didn't talk about it to anyone for a long time. I was in the Navy then, and I would have risked losing my security clearance and my rank and my job, and worse than that, they could have put me in a mental ward. I eventually did tell my sister about it. She knew someone who had had a sighting almost identical to mine. He had his sighting at the same time I did, too. The only difference was is that he saw it on the east side of Fort Benning and I saw it on the west side. Oh, that's a, it's a UFO story and he, he, it's, he sees something shooting beams of light and then has a lost time experience, which this lost time stuff is so interesting to me. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of like, to me, it kind of feels like going to sleep, like when you go to sleep at 10 or 11 o'clock. The next thing you know, it's morning time. You didn't lose time, but you kind of did. You were unconscious for six or eight hours. And it's like you're, you go to sleep and you wake up and boom, there you are. You're, you're, you're close to one place. You're, you're heading on a road. The next thing you know, boom, you're sitting at a gas pump in Columbus, Georgia. That's got to be weird. Anyway, I love this story. I really liked it. I appreciate it. Here's an email from a gentleman. I know his name, but he didn't say to use it, so I'm not going to. The story takes place in Ohio. I'm an avid doorsman in southwest Ohio, and I hunt every species in the state and fish for most available fish. During the summer of 2016, when we were between our junior and senior year in high school, my friend and I decided to do some fishing at Sycamore State Park near Trotwood, Ohio. We got there at 6.30 p.m. and right away we noticed all the cars in the parking lot. There was a wedding reception going on at the reservable shelter. Well, we congratulated them as we walked by and headed on down the trail to the pond. It was a good night. We were fishing for catfish and we started getting hits almost as soon as we dropped our lines in the water. It's easy to lose track of time when you're having that much fun. Suddenly, we realized it was 10.30 and the park was going to close at 11. So we packed up our gear and all the fish we'd caught and we headed back to the wooden stairs to the parking lot. Neither one of us had a flashlight and my phone was broken, so we were relying on the light from my friend Samsung to guide us. The security light from the shelter was still on when we got to the top, which helped. We rounded the shelter, and there, right under the light, bent over a trash can, was a large creature. We stopped dead in our tracks, and my friend gasped loud enough that it hurt us. It straightened up, and it turned its hips, and it slipped away into the darkness. Well, we didn't waste a minute. We fast-walked to my car, and we jumped in, and we sped off at 70 miles an hour all the way home. My friend never believed in Bigfoot or anything like that before. I think, after that night, he might be convinced now. You think so? You think so? Sees a big, big, uh, some large creature bent over, probably standing on two legs, digging in the trash. Yeah, that would convince me. It's a very good story. It's short and to the point and really good, really well written. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up button. Maybe even hit the subscribe button. Come back and watch another video. You're probably seeing on your end screen right now, Steve Lilly number three. It's just a it's just a thumbnail with a three on it. That's a brand new Steve Lilly story. It's a good one. It's over an hour long. Hope you guys will go over and subscribe and listen to that new Steve Lilly story. And I'll have another one up probably uh, by Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll have another one up. All right, you guys have a good rest of your Thanksgiving weekend, and we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks.